Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to World History. Today, we're going to continue our unit on industrialization and, and national nationalism by talking about the creation and the unification of a state called Germany. You've probably heard of Germany before, but what you might not be familiar with is that Germany was a relatively modern nation state in the history of sort of European nation states. So we're going to talk about the process by which Germany was created, the types of nationalism used to create Germany, and, uh, and, the, and the rise of a guy named Otto von Bismarck, who was kind of the architect of this modern German state. So as we talked about before, nationalism became a really important force in European politics. This idea that your nationality needed to have a nation state in order to protect their interests and push forward and help develop their culture, their technology, their military strength, things like that. So the idea that you, if you were a sort of a nation, a stateless nation, you were vulnerable to the growing power of other European nation states. And this led to the push for Europeans to try to create nation states for their various ethnicity. The problem with Germany is that the German speaking people are sort of scattered all across Central Europe. And there really has never been sort of a unified German nation at this point. The Germanic people are, again, scattered across a variety of different countries, you know, going into what is today the Netherlands and Switzerland and Austria, stuff like that. Uh, Prussia, as we talked about previously, is the most powerful German nation state. But the real question is what Germans are in, what Germans are out, what percentage of a population of a region has to be German before they'll try to integrate it into this Germany? Should we be try to, trying to unite all the German-speaking peoples? And then what do we do with the other minority groups that are there? And the other big German problem is what do we do with the Austrians? Because as far as sort of German-speaking groups of people and sort of Germanic groups of people, the Austrians have their own multinational empire. And so would any Germany include Austria? And then if it does, what happens to the other various nationalities? Because the Austrian Habsburgs are not giving up their multinational empire without a fight. So how do you incorporate them into a centralized Germany while still, not, while still taking into account all of the variety of different ethnic groups within the Austrian empire? So this is a massive problem because Austria, again, is one of the five powerful nation states in Europe. And if Prussia is going to be the power behind unifying Germany, what happens with the Austrians? In the end, Prussia is going to be the power behind unifying Germany. It was pretty clear to everyone that Prussia was the heart sort of of this German unification movement. Prussia had been slowly increasing their territory, going all the way back through to the era of absolutism, when we talked about Friedrich Wilhelm and Friedrich the Great and some of our other Prussian kings. And we talked about the Prussian history of sort of a militarized governmental aristocracy. And the fact that Prussian culture and Prussian nobility are going to be tied into this idea of military and especially infantry strength. And so this, again, is going all the way back to some of our earliest Prussian kings, specifically Friedrich the Great, who is then going to bring all of these sort of uh, military innovations into the Prussian military. And as we hopefully remember, as part of the Seven Years' War, Prussia stomped on more or less all the other great land powers of Europe, almost simul almost on their own, almost, uh, yeah, well, England have worked to establish their large overseas empire. So we also hopefully remember that the Frankfurt Parliament in the whole revolutions of 1848 was an attempt to create a unified Germany, but that the German leadership, specifically Friedrich Wilhelm and Otto von Bismarck, refused to follow along with the German parliament's plan because it would require a constitution that would limit the power of Prussian kings. And so Friedrich Wilhelm turned down the crown from the gutter, as he called it, because the Frankfurt parliament wanted to limit his power in a constitutional way, because the revolutions of 1848 were all about trying to push liberal and radical political ideas against the sort of conservative establishment. And so the Frankfurt parliament were destroyed, were destroyed their leaders were killed or arrested, and there was no unification of Germany. Here we've got Friedrich Wilhelm IV laying down the idea that he's not willing to accept any sort of constitution which would limit his power. And so in 1848, one of the effects was not the creation of a unified Germany because it would have led, would have, because even though Prussia and Friedrich Wilhelm could have unified Germany at this time, it would have led to a decreasing of his political power. 
what 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 Otto von Bismarck, one of the German sort of nobles, the Junkers, took out of this movement was that they needed to adopt the language of liberalism, but to push conservative ideas. This created an idea called absolute constitutionalism, the idea that, yes, actually, what, what we should do is we should create a charter of government. This idea of the sort of informal, unlimited power of kings actually isn't really serving the conservative purpose anymore. Instead, what if we create a constitution that gives the king absolute power? Then the liberals can't go around whining about how there's no constitution, but the power of the king is not in any way diminished. And so, he, Fried, and so Friedrich Wilhelm and, and Otto von Bismarck pushed this absolutist constitution onto the people and then put it to a vote of the people in order to, again, use the tactics of liberalism against them. And the conservative German peasantry, who generally liked the king and the aristocracy, voted overwhelmingly to help support it. And so the sort of bourgeois elements, the liberal bourgeois elements in the city were outmaneuvered by the conservative leadership and the peasantry who didn't really support their ideas. And so Prussia is going to become a constitutional monarchy, but it's a constitutional monarchy in which the constitution gives the king almost absolute power. He's also, Otto von Bismarck is also going to for, push to industrialize and modernize Germany, bringing in new innovations from the Industrial Revolution, having watched sort of what happened to France and what happened to uh, England during this whole industrial era. We're going to start importing new innovations and bringing in new military technologies in order to make sure that Prussia is a cutting edge state. And so there's not going to be any fear of innovation in Prussia because the conservative powers that be have complete control over sort of the society and government. And so this process of industrialization is going to be led top down by the government in order to build up the power of Prussia. And so Otto von Bismarck becomes the architect of this. He's going to be the chancellor and the, uh, the prime minister for Friedrich Wilhelm. And he's going to try to push the, unif the unification of Germany, keeping Prussia in power. And he's going to decide that keeping Austria out of this new Germany is going to be incredibly important to keep German power pure and to create this German nation state. And so whereas Italian unification is done by emphasizing the similarities of the Italian people, German unification is going to be focused on identifying specific outgroups like the Austrians and emphasizing the difference between Prussian Germans and Austrian Germans. And so it's a, it's a national, nationalism of exclusion as opposed to a nationalism of acceptance. And Otto von Bismarck is going to be famous for adopting this style of real politic, this idea that there is really no morality in politics. You should instead pursue whatever means necessary in order to achieve your goals. And we're going to see a lot of that out of him. So, for example, in order to keep the Austrians out, he's going to provoke what's called the Seven Weeks War, by annexing Bohemia, which was formerly a part of a, or sort of a tributary state of the Austrian Empire, into Germany. This provokes a military response from Austria, but the Prussian modernized military is going to absolutely obliterate Austria over the span of seven weeks. He's also going to make a deal, of course, with Piedmont Sardinia, as we talked about last time, in order to distract the Austrians on their southern flank. Once he's crushed the Austrians, he's going to then annex the Bohemian region, and significantly increase the power of Germany. In doing though, in doing that, take a moment and pause and read this. His goal was to not alienate the Austrians because he saw in the future a, a, an alliance of Germany and Austria as being very important to counter French and possibly British power going forward. And so he's going to just crush Austria, but then help them up and help Austria rebuild themselves in order to make sure that they're still going to be a powerful ally against the other powers of Europe. And so with that, we're going to see the annexation of some southern parts of, of, uh, southern parts of Germany, of what used to be Austria, bringing in Bavaria and some other incredibly valuable regions, including the city of Munich, which is going to eventually become an industrial hub, and some coal mining areas sort of down here when we get into the sort of hillier regions of southern Germany. So there's your seven weeks war, annexing more territory into this new German state. 
And then finally, we have the Franco-Prussian War because some significant, some significant industrial territories along the Rhine River were currently a part of France that had been taken going back to the sort of Napoleonic conflicts. And Prussia felt the need to recapture those territories in order to create a completed German nation state, both because they were Germanly, German, they were ethnically German, but also because they were very economically important to the future of a Germany. And so he, had, he staged something called the Ems Dispatch, which, uh, in which uh, the, the king of Germany ostensibly slighted a French diplomat in order to offend French honor. Uh, it was a mostly it was a completely staged event to attempt to get France to um, to behave aggressively, and so the goal of this was to provoke France into a war. As you hopefully remember, France is now in the Second France French Empire under Napoleon III, and Napoleon III thought himself to be his you know the heir to his grand to his uh, great uncle. He thought himself to be the second coming of Napoleon. And one of the things that Napoleon did was crush the Prussians and force them into an embarrassingly punitive, punitive uh, treaty. And so he wanted to do the same thing. This provided him with an opportunity to launch a patriotic war against Germany, crush the Germans as his uncle did, and, uh, you know, restore glory to France and, again, you know, build his own mystique. So he's going to pro – so Bismarck provokes the war. And Germany then launches an invasion of France after France uh, offers a declaration of war to Germany. So Otto von Bismarck, of course, because France declared war first and because he got Austria to declare war first, doesn't look like the aggressor in either of these conflicts because his goal was to continue to establish a balance of power in Europe and to prevent other countries like England or Russia from jumping in. So by making it look like the French were the aggressor, he was able to stop anyone from coming to France's aid, which is going to become incredibly beneficial for the Germans going forward. In preparation for this war, Otto von Bismarck also built a series of new rail lines to connect to the front. And so whereas the French were in no, by no means prepared for this war and had not built sort of an industrial structure to fight it, for the, for the Prussians, they're bringing in their heavy artillery, they're bringing in their ammunition, they're bringing in troops by train. And so this leads them to be able to mobilize much, much, much more quickly than the French and be prepared to fight a much longer protracted war than the French. Whereas Napoleon III is basically marching off because he believes he's his genius great uncle and he thinks his own military genius is going to win the day, Otto von Bismarck is meticulously planning every stage of this. At the Battle of Sedan, the Prussian army absolutely obliterates the French army. The Prussian artillery outranges the French artillery by significant margins, and it's going to lead to just an absolute devastating defeat for the French. In fact, it's so bad that the emperor himself, Napoleon III, is captured in this battle. Uh, the, the fort that he's in is surrounded. It's a, he's put under siege, and he's forced to humiliatingly surrender to, the, uh, to Friedrich Wilhelm and Otto von Bismarck. And so with the French army gone and Napoleon captured, the French overthrow him. They have another revolution. They overthrow the government and the French empire, declare themselves a new republic, and form what's called the government of national defense in order to try to, res to, try to resist Prussian aggression. So the Germans now have Napoleon, but he's no longer the head of state of France. So they're going to have to continue to march on in order to defeat the French and secure the territories they want to secure. They do this by putting the city of Paris under siege. Adolf Thiers had built substantial walls around the city of Paris at this point that they believed were impregnable. But Otto von Bismarck is simply going to totally cut the city off from all outside forces, cut off all food and water supplies into the city, and then begin to bombard the city with cannons. And so we're going to see him not attack the walls of the city, but begin to attack the civilian infrastructure within the city in order to attempt to force the Parisians to surrender. The Parisians famously try to send out calls for help on balloons, which are found, but no one's really, really willing to march against the Prussian army to save Paris. And things in Paris get super, super, super bad. Namely, uh, they get down to eating all of the animals in the Parisian zoo. And uh, in the end, they start running out of food and only the wealthy are able to afford, you know, household pests like rats to eat, whereas the average citizens of Paris are absolutely starving. 
And so Paris is eventually forced to surrender. Here's the uh, st here's a stand or a um, a shop selling rats and cats to only wealthy aristocracy members who can afford them. And the French people are utterly obliterated by this and just destroyed by the Prussians. This shatters any sort of illusion of French milit military uh, invincibility and uh, leads to an incredibly punitive treaty where the Germans force the French to pay a huge indemnity payment for starting this war. This was in retaliation to Napoleon forcing the Prussians to pay a huge indemnity for the last round of warfare. And if you think that this is going to end well, you've never heard of the Treaty of Versailles. So Treaty of Frankfurt, France has to pay infinity dollars to the Germans. The Germans march triumphantly through Paris, through the Arc, the, down the boulevards built by Napoleon, uh, through the Arc de Triomphe of Napoleon's great uncle, occupying the city. It's a humiliating, humiliating defeat for France. And the German Empire itself is declared in the famous Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. So in the former the former symbol of French power, this bastion of French glory and wealth and power, Otto von Bismarck declares the creation of a new state of Germany, spectacularly humiliating the French. So um, again, bad blood between Germany and France. This is going to continue, you know, for the next hundred-ish years and is going to help explain a lot of the developments that are going to happen in the future. So yeah, that's a thing. The new German Empire is going to contain all of these territories. We're going to have this German nation state, and Germany is going to become one of the great powers of Europe going forward. So that's the story of the unification of Germany, but we're not quite done with France just yet, because in the aftermath of this humiliating defeat, as the Germans withdraw, the Parisians rise up again. The common people of Paris, having suffered through this unbelievably horrible siege, refuse to recognize the new government of the French of the French Third Republic and create what's called the Paris Commune. This is an attempt to use the sort of values of communism and socialism to create a more equal society, to have the people rise up and to bring the sort of dictatorship of the proletariat to fruition. But not having compulsory, compulsory military service, the Paris Commune is not able to defend itself particularly well and the forces of the Third Republic are going to rally in order to fight back against the Paris Commune. The forces, the government in Versailles is going to raise an army to march on Paris, and they're going to put the city of Paris under siege for a second time, which they are very, very, very not prepared for. Here's the uh, declaration against the, against the people of Versailles and the creation of the Paris Commune. So take a moment, read. Hopefully it's going to sound pretty familiar to you unfortunately. And in what's called the Bloody Week, the forces of the Third Republic storm the city of Paris for a second time, driving out the communists, re-seizing control of the city, and leading to substantial destruction as a substantial part of Paris burns down, either from communists setting fire to buildings or from French soldiers attacking the city. Accounts differ. Tons of people are killed, and the Third Republic reestablishes itself and retakes over the city of Paris. So that's the bloody week and the end result of this. And it's the end result of this next attempt to establish communism and socialism within Europe. So a massive setback for the communists, destruction of the Paris Commune, and France is substantially weakened, but ostensibly still a nation state. So that brings us to the end of the unification of Germany. Next, we're going to move to some of the old empires of Europe and talk about the growth of the, the growth and reform of the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire, as these two great Eastern empires struggle to modernize, to develop themselves, and to take their place amongst this sort of modern world that is developing. So we'll pick that up where we left off next time when we come back. For now, thank you for listening.